Okay, well, I know it says in your bulletin, verses 7 through 13, but I am going to today revert back to my old ways and um, only preach two verses. So uh, what am I going to do? Um, I'm going to do two verses a day, verses 7 and 8. But John is writing here in the book of Second John uh, uh, to a church in Ephesus uh, about the same time as he wrote the book of First John. I don't know if it's the same church or if it's a different local church, but he's writing to a church. And last time, last week, as we opened the book for the first time, because it's only got 13 verses, we briefly covered John's concern for us that we'll be walking in the truth. Walking in the truth of Jesus Christ, who is the truth. Following him. Trusting him. Con with a continual application of the gospel in our lives, manifested in, demonstrated by, us loving each other. That's what John was preaching on last week. That's what we talked about last time. And today John turns to another concern, which I want to try to tackle here in the next few moments. Verse 7 and 8. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. And just like last week, what I said, much of what John writes here in Second John is almost exactly the same thing that he talked about in First John. We're just going to preach the same sermons over and over again because he writes the same things over again. He's repeating himself, essentially the same thing. And we studied this back in February, what he says today when we're in First John, chapter 2, verse 18. I, I couldn't remember it was February. I had to look it up. And I'm kind of uh, ashamed to say I even had to look up my sermon so I'd remember what I preached. So I won't blame you if you had to. When, when did we preach that? When is he going to talk about this again? I don't remember the first time. I don't blame you. But look it up. First John 2, 18, John writes, Dear children, this is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. It says in chapter 2, verse 22, Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. And then he says again in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So just like he says in 1 John, he says it again in 2 John. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge that Jesus Christ has coming in the flesh have gone on into the world. Such a person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch out for them. Watch out. A very solemn and uh, a solemn warning by John, and it's very common in the entire New Testament. Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it. Peter writes about it. John again writes about it. Jude writes about it. Many false professors, many false prophets will come in and will come into the church and will leave out of the church with all kinds of teachings, all kinds of heretical doctrines, all kinds of wrong things. Many false teachers. False teachers who deny and distort biblical truth. Now I'm not talking about differences of interpretation about things that are difficult to understand. There are Bible passages that many godly Christians disagree with and argue passionately with each other about. We're not talking about that today. These false teachers deny things about God. They deny Jesus Christ. That's the main focus today. That's what we'll look at here today. That's what John is being specific about. These people will deny the person of the whole, of the Trent of the of the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. These people deny and distort teaching about man, that he's just a creature who has fallen into sin. In fact, they'll distort and mess up the teaching about what sin is. That it's not an offense of a holy God. They'll make it something easy to swallow, easy to listen to. Many false teachers deny and distort the biblical truth about salvation, that it's by faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the only way you get saved. They distort that. 
They had works to it. They had all kinds of things to it. Many false teachers distort and um, deny biblical truth about the Scripture. That the Scripture is the complete authoritative Word of God, infallible, inerrant, binding upon our conscience. It tells me how to think. It tells me what to believe. It tells me how to act. And because I fail to believe the right things and fail to act the right things, it's not because of the Scripture, it's because of me and my sin. Something they forget to tell you about or they don't tell you about. False teachers abound in the world and do distort all of these truths. And there are many other distortions too. And many of these false teachers used to be in the church. John says that back in chapter 2 when we were there, uh, verse 19. They went out from us. They used to be part of the church. They used to be in here with us that they did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Paul says to the Ephesian elders in Miletus when he went there on his way to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31, he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Just like John's saying here, watch out. Just like Paul says elsewhere, watch out. Just like Jesus says elsewhere, watch out. Be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day. In fact, Jesus does say it in John, Matthew seven fifteen. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They don't come to you dressed like wolves. They don't come to you in their regular clothes. They come to you looking like a sheep. They're one of us. They're in here with us. They're distorting the truth in the church and leaving out from the church. Watch out for those people. And Paul says again, 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith. Now, in order to abandon the faith, that means you had to be in the faith. You had to be one of us. You had to be part of the church. You had to be part of the local church. You had to come here on Sundays and worship with us. You had to be part of what we were, what we were doing. What's going on here? You sang the songs. They will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teaching comes through hypocritical liars. That's a very similar word for deceiver. Whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. I'll give you one more, Second Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3. He writes, there, will, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. They're not going to come out and hold up a sign saying, false teaching, watch this. Y'all want to hear some false teaching? I got it for you today. They're never going to do that. It's always secretly. It's always covertly. It's always with a stealth aspect. They'll introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. These false teachers make stuff up. They make this stuff up. They make it up because they're deceivers. That's what John says. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Many deceivers, and they just make it up. Come up with things to say that are not true. Deceiver is a, a Greek word. Well, deceiver is an English word. The Greek word comes, uh, is the word we get our English word planet from. Planos is the Greek word. We get planet. It means to wander. These people wander. They are wanderers, and they wander away from the truth. They wander from the truth. That's what the word is. Deceivers, they wander from the truth. And Jude, in his uh, uh, book, calls them wandering stars. They get you to believe things. I'm just going to say it all again. I want to preach it again. Almost the exact same thing I preached before. These people distort the truth. They lie. The deceivers in John's day were those who denied that Jesus is fully and truly God. And they also deny that Jesus is fully and truly man. 
They deny that Jesus is the God-man. That's what they denied. In John's day, that's what John is writing about, people who distort and misunderstand and teach wrong views about who Jesus is. They teach that Jesus is somebody else who has a split personality. Maybe he's schizophrenic. He's not a man. He's not God. All those kinds of things, that's what John's writing about. They deny that Jesus is the God-man. That's what John means when he says that Jesus is coming in the flesh. They deny that Jesus is coming in the flesh. He is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the second person, the second member of the triune God, the Trinity. God is three in one. Three persons, unique, individual persons of the same essence, the same purpose. Everything's the same about them except their person. And Jesus has come in the flesh. God came, became a man. That's who Jesus, the Son of God, is. That's what John's writing about. This is a very critical doctrine. Very critical. This is a key doctrine. If you miss this, you don't have salvation. You have to understand who Jesus is. So I just want to briefly go through that again with you today. In Colossians 1.16, Paul writes, For by him, talking about Jesus, he's talking about the Son of God, the Son, by the Son, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Right, what do you get from that text? The Son is the creator. You know who spoke, let there be light? You know whose words those were? The Son of God. Jesus spoke those words. He wasn't Jesus then, but he was the Son of God. Eternal God is the creator. Hebrews says the same thing, chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Who made the universe? Jesus made the universe. The Son made the universe. It doesn't get any clearer to me than, than John chapter 1 which I think is fresh in John's mind as he writes the book of 2 John to the people in Ephesus, to the church there. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So whoever this Word is, he's God. He was in the beginning, and he's God. And then he says, Through him all things, he was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Uh, this Word made everything. The Word who was in the beginning, who was with God, and who was God, made everything. The Word did that. Now, this Word, the Word, the Creator, the Creator of everything, who made everything, Creator of all things, God, says in verse 14, became flesh. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word, the Creator, God, became a man, became flesh. It's not just a Christmas story where he took on the, became a baby. This is, this is the doctrine that we must believe. This is the doctrine that we must hang on to. This is critical, crucial, fundamental doctrine. You have to believe this. Jesus, the Son, Jesus Christ became flesh. God took on flesh. God became a man. Made his dwelling among us. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's what John means. He became a man. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 5 through 7, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, Christ Jesus, very nature, is God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. There's so much I want to say. I mean, there's so much we could say. We could spend a, a, a month of Sundays just talking about Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus came in the flesh. God came in the flesh. And I would say it again and again and again until I can't breathe anymore. I just want to preach that Jesus Christ God 
became flesh. Jesus Christ is the God-man. He is fully, truly God and fully, truly man. That is our doctrine. That's what the Bible teaches. You must acknowledge that Jesus is who he is. Fully God, fully man. Truly God, truly man. Not just an appearance of a man, not just a, a phantom of a man, not just the form of a man, but a real man. And the Bible teaches that. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Peter's preaching a sermon. The day of Pentecost. It says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Y'all remember this dude? Y'all remember this guy? He was around doing miracles, wonders, and signs. You saw it, you knew it, and you knew they were from God. No one could do these things unless God was with him. Y'all knew that. This man, Christ Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, this man, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The Bible speaks of Jesus as man. He's not only God, he is also man. He is a man. In Luke chapter 2, verse 40 and verse 52, it says, okay, we, we know the Christmas story. He was born, laid into a manger. He was a baby. He took on flesh, and he was a helpless baby. But it says the child grew and became strong. He grew up. Who grows up? Your kids grow up, don't they? Drives you nuts. They drove you nuts when they were little, and then they drive you nuts after they grow up. Not Jesus. He, he grew up just like a man. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. That means he grew up. I don't know how tall he was. I don't know what his body shape was like, but he became a man. He grew up into a man. He was a man. He was fully human, and he grew up into a full-grown man. That's what that means. And he had all the weaknesses of a man. He was uh, hungry, sleepy, tired, thirsty. All the elements that make a person a person, a human being, he had those elements. He was weak. He couldn't even carry his own cross. They beat him to death, and he couldn't carry his own cross. He was so weak. Jesus was so human that the people who knew him the best, the people who knew him the longest, the people who'd known him since he was a little boy, the people who knew him his whole life didn't know he was God. All they thought of him was a man. Just a normal, regular guy, just one of us, just another guy. It says in Matthew 13, 54 through 57, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogues, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary, mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? They took offense at him. This is just one of us. I've known him as he, since he was a little kid. Now he's some know-it-all showing off to us in the synagogue, and we don't like him anymore. They thought of it, You know what they thought of him? It was just another man. So, so much so that... Uh, and they had no idea that he was God in the flesh. They had no idea who he was. The Pharisees, the enemies of, of Christ, the enemies who hated him and were always after him, wanting to trip him up and make him stumble, uh, ones who always came at him with interrogations that would mess every one of us up, but they didn't mess him up. Guess what they thought about him? Just a man. Jesus was doing miracles all the time. Then he would say things, and they would get mad, pick up rocks, and want to throw at him. John chapter 10, verse 33, he says, Which of these miracles do you want to stone me for? Oh, we're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. What do they think of him? What do they think of Jesus? Who do they think Jesus is? Just a man. 
Now here in John's day, in the church where John's preaching at, where the church is, where John's writing to, there are teachers who don't believe that Jesus even is a man. Even if they did believe he's God, they didn't believe he was man. And if they did believe he was man, they didn't believe he was God. He is both of those things. 100% so. He was human in every way, just like us, except in one way, he didn't commit sin. He is sinless. And that, that would take a whole sermon right there. I'll just give you a couple verses in Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way. He had to be fully human. He had to take on flesh, just like us. Just like us, he had to be just like us. In order that he might be a, become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And then in chapter 4, verse 15, he says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who is tempted in every way. Just as we are, yet was without sin. And I'll say it again. This is a critical, fundamental doctrine Jesus Christ is God who became a man. The Son of God took on flesh and became a man. And you must know and believe this doctrine. It concerns who Jesus is. There are a lot of doctrines, well, they're not a lot. There, there are a lot of teachings out there that we can argue about, we can fight about, we can, and I'll just tell you you're wrong and you will be wrong. But this is not one of them. You can't be wrong about this. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. He came, became flesh. He became a man and sacrificed himself to substitute himself for our sins. And only he could do that because he was a sinless man. Now, there are a lot of cults out there. A lot of cults. You got Mormons. You got Jehovah's Witnesses. You got full-blown liberals. Uh, you have oneness Pentecostals. They have all kind of varying views about who Jesus is. They don't really, either they don't believe he's God or they believe he's some kind of weird thing. They promote many errors. But there are groups out there, popular teachers, and I'm not going to spend the, a lot of time like I did before naming all the names of everybody out there. Y'all know who a lot of these guys are popular teachers in Christian world that promote many er errors. The prosperity gospel uh, gets on my nerves more than any of them. Or I think it used to get on my nerves more than any of them. If you're a Christian, you ought to be rich. I think that's atrocious and that's a lie to people. Or if you're a Christian, you should never be sick. Or if you're a Christian, you should be able to go to one of these fake healing concerts they do and get fake healed and then die a week later. I think uh, even worse now is woke, critical race theory preachers. These guys don't understand the nature of the gospel. That God will save people from every tribe, language, nation, and people. They, they mess up, they were racist by preaching anti-racist teaching the only way to stop discrimination is to discriminate more and you're guilty just by the color of your skin these people have messed it up really bad that really is annoying to me false teachers false teachers people who I admire or did admire are teaching this stuff it's garbage we have wildly popular teachers who don't believe in the trinity they don't believe that God is one and three separate, equal, distinct persons of the same essence. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You have false teachers out there. Every single sermon is only a motivational message. That you're not a sinner who deserves to go to hell and to have offended a holy God and he's going to judge you. They never teach that. In fact, they'll teach you things like how good and wonderful you are so you go home feeling great from church every Sunday. They never talk about sin or repentance. In fact, they'll say stuff like how much like Christ you really are already before you even heard of Christ. Before you even heard a message about who Jesus is, they already tell you that you were just like him already. And coming to Christ means you just find out that's what you really were all along. 
very wildly popular. I don't mean uh, fringe heretics. I mean in-your-face television heretics. The whole Christian satellite could fall out of the sky into the ocean and not a single one of us would be harmed by the teaching that we miss that's on Christian TV. I mean that. That whole, all of those satellites could crash. We'll be fine. We'll be just fine. They're all teaching heresy. Most of them are. All kinds of things. And John calls them out. John calls them out. Verse 7. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Any such person like that just wanders away, wanders from the truth, wanders from the uh, sound doctrine, wanders from the Bible. Teaches stuff they made up. Whoever does not hold the sound doctrine of Jesus Christ as human and divine, John calls him an antichrist. And I don't think he means the eschatological end times antichrist. Whenever we hear the word antichrist, that's what we think of. There's a man coming who's going to take over the world with religious and political power. He's going to set himself up as God. He's going to oppose Christ, and he's going to kill as many Christians as he can. That's the Antichrist of the end times. Paul calls him the law, man of lawlessness. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's described there. He's described in Revelation. He's going to come during the great rebellion and the great apostasy of the world and during the great tribulation. That, that's a whole other sermon. But that's not what John's talking about here. He's talking about the Antichrist. He's the only New Testament writer that uses this word, Antichrist. And he used it five times in his, in his writing. It just means against Christ. If you teach false doctrine concerning Jesus Christ, you're teaching against Christ. An antichrist is someone whose teaching goes against Jesus. It's anyone that has an erroneous view of Jesus. Anyone who has a wrong view of who Jesus is, is an antichrist. Just like, very much like, if not on, the, not on the same level, the real Antichrist who's coming to take over the world. Either mess up, just mess up the nature of God or the nature of Jesus Christ. You don't see him as who he really is, God and man in one person. Not schizophrenic. Not split personality. One person is both God and man. If you don't see that, you're an Antichrist. Or that he's not righteous. If you think Jesus sinned, if you think Jesus ever sinned, if you think Jesus ever committed a sin against God, you're an antichrist. You don't understand. You're, you believe stuff that's against him. He is not a sinner. He did not commit sin. He did not fall like Adam. If you believe that his death is not sufficient to save you're an antichrist. If you don't believe anything that the scriptures teach about Jesus, no matter what it says about him, you're an antichrist. You're a deceiver. You're deceived and you're a deceiver. You have wandered from the truth. You do not believe who the Bible says Jesus is. Anything. Like I said, we're not talking about different interpretations about predestination or tongues or baptism or end times. We're talking about the person of Jesus Christ. You mess that up, you mess it all up. You're antichrist. This is all about what you believe about who Jesus is. That's what John's writing about. That's the context of his culture, of his, uh, his letter. And like we could go on and on about all these other heresies, these other errors that men teach nowadays that are on Christian TV. Wildly popular men. He's talking about who Jesus is. And he says in verse 8, Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Now, when you first read that, you think, well, this is difficult. This is a, not an easy one. None of this has been easy for me. It cannot mean, though, that you lose your salvation, uh, that you do not lose what you have worked for. 
It can't mean, can't mean that you lose your salvation because we've already established that after many sermons, the doctrine of security of salvation. That's what the Bible teaches. Someone who is saved never loses their salvation. I'll give you one verse and then we'll keep moving. Uh, John 6, 39, This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise him up at the last day. If you're one of Jesus Christ, if you're one of his followers, if you're one of his disciples, if you belong to him, he's not going to lose you. You cannot be lost. So you can't lose it. That's a bad doctrine. So that cannot mean, verse, uh, verse 8 of Second John, cannot mean that you lose your salvation. But it also can't mean that you can't lose your salvation because salvation is not something you acquire by works. You can't earn your salvation by works, therefore you can't keep it by works. If you could earn it by works, maybe you could not do enough works and lose it somehow. But you can't work hard enough, you can't be good enough, you can't do enough things that please God of your own that's going to earn you salvation. Therefore, you can't, do enough, you can't not do enough things to lose it. Because you didn't get it by works, you can't lose it by works. You can't keep it by works. Romans 4, Abraham was saved by works. Abraham was saved by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, not by works so that no one can boast. By grace, they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? What does God want from us? What work do we need to do so that we can be saved and have eternal life? Tell us, Jesus. He says it. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent, faith alone. Not works, faith. So you can't lose it because of security of, of salvation, and you can't earn it by faith, so you can't, you can't earn it by works, so you can't lose it when you don't have enough works. But, John still writes, Watch out that you not, do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be fully rewarded. There is a danger in the church. All the way to the word you is second person plural. He's talking about you, the whole church. There's a danger in the church, you. There's a real danger that you'll be sucked in and carried away by false teachers. And when you get sucked in and carried away by false teachers, the danger is you will ruin your testimony and your gospel influence. You'll have no credibility. You believe false teaching, you have no credibility. You lost it. This is the same thing Paul was concerned about. He wrote about this many times. I'll give you a couple places. Uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, writing to the Corinthians. These are Christians. He talks about them as Christians, many, many times, he says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. I'm worried, I'm worried that you guys are going to listen to something that's false. And be drawn away to it. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we, we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. I'm worried that you listen to a bunch of junk. I'm worried that you listen to teachers who do not teach the truth. They teach lies. They teach deception. They are antichrist. And they're all over the place. And they got Christian hack hashtags on their TikTok. I've seen them. Like, what is this? What is this? A minute's long worth of junk that says Christian on it. The church has to be discerning. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. They were being persecuted. We know we're going to be persecuted. He's worried about the Thessalonians. He couldn't stand it anymore. He sent Timothy. So I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. We left you a sound church. I've been down here in Athens for a while writing this letter to you, and now I'm worried that somehow you've fallen away. 
You've been tempted. You started believing the wrong things. You couldn't handle the persecution anymore. I sent Timothy to find out about it. Galatians chapter 4, 11, he goes, I fear for you, talking to the Galatians, that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Now, this is exactly the same thing I said when we were in 1 John chapter 4. The church has to be discerning about false teaching. And when I say discerning about false teaching, I'm, I basically mean this. Discerning enough to be suspicious about everything. Whatever comes on, whatever they say, whatever you read, whatever's on your Facebook feed, whatever's on your Instagram feed, whatever's on your TikTok feed that looks like it's Christian, you automatically, default setting, default position, suspicious. I'm not believing it. Automatically, not believing it. He says, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test means to examine for approval. Check it out and observe carefully to determine the genuineness of it. You measure whatever you hear some good Christian looking fellow in sheep's clothing looks like, says cool things, very dynamic, very passionate, very charismatic. Check it up against Scripture. See if you can find any of that stuff in Scripture. See if you can find any of that stuff in sound doctrine that's lasted through the centuries. I, I'll bet you you do that. A lot of it needs to be thrown in the trash. Watching and discernment. Watching and discerning Christian teaching means not believing every spirit. Testing it to see if it's really from God. And I'll say, this ought to be, this ought to be your default position. No matter what it says, no matter who said it, your default position is, huh, I'm not sure about that. I am not about to get sucked in by false teaching. For everything, everything. If you believe every spirit, you're, you're somehow, some way, someday, someday going to get deluded into false teaching. You will. Even me. I love it when some of you come up and, not all of you, hey, pastor, you said, you said, I got a bone to pick with you. Keep doing that, Please. You find yourself interested in a bad teacher, attached to a bad teacher. Everything that comes across, like I said, in Jesus' name, everything that comes across with a Christian hashtag, you ought to be cautious. You ought to be cautious. Watch out. John says, watch out. Paul says, watch out. Jesus says, watch out. All of them say, watch out. The word means to be careful, vigilant. Watch out or you lose. And the word lose there in the text means to uh, fail to keep or fail to maintain. Cease to have. You lost it. You lost it. You lose what you've labored for. You lose what you worked hard to maintain and keep because you listened to a false teacher and believed a false teacher and hung on to a false teacher, got attached to them. Because they're... I'll say this. Anytime someone says something that's clever, if it sounds clever, if it sounds clever, throw it away first. You might can pick it up later once you figure out what the guy's really saying, but I don't care what it is. I can't stand clever teachers that's got some new way of saying something, even if it's true. Don't say it in a new way. Just say it the way it's always been said. Jesus is the God-man. He made you a new creature. He made you a new creature through faith in him. You weren't the same as you were. You aren't the same now as you were before. Who comes up with that garbage? Stop. Jesus created us in, God created us in Christ Jesus to be new creatures. 
That's all there. Like I said, if, if, this, if the satellite fell out of the sky, we'd, I'd be happy. I'm not kidding. All Christian TV could go away and we'd be just fine. You have to watch out. You labored for a credible and vibrant witness of Christ in the world. You lost it. You labored for a stable and healthy church environment and you lost it. You labored for a rich and good welcome into the kingdom. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom. Good and faithful servant. You'll lose that. Instead, John says, watch out so you don't lose what you work for. Instead, you'll be welcomed with a full reward. You'll be rewarded fully. Now, the word reward means to a wage. I like the old English word recompense. I saw a cartoon with this character kept saying recompense. I thought, that's the coolest cartoon I've ever seen. Recompense. A wage. A payment for a job well done. Throw away the trash, the false teachers. Throw away the garbage, and you'll be rewarded. You'll be repaid very well. In fact, the word full means containing as much as possible. You'll re be rewarded as fully as can possibly be rewarded. Now I want to say, salvation is all of grace. There is nothing but grace. Grace means it's a favor that God did for you and gave you that you didn't earn. Nothing you could do to get saved on your own. God did it as a gift, a free gift, period, through faith in his son. That's it. In fact, everything is all of grace. Every blessing you will ever have, every blessing, every good thing you're ever going to get from God is because of what Jesus did when he paid for that on the cross when he died there and shed his blood. He gave his blood so that every blessing you have is paid for by him. Everything, everything, nothing you earn, nothing you earn. You do not earn any favor from God. If you get my notes online, on my email, uh, I left out the word not there, so don't mess that up. If I, if I left out the word not on, on, her, on purpose, I would be a heretic. You do not earn any favor from God. I don't know exactly how it works. I really don't. Uh, this is one of those puzzling doctrines. I'm not sure how to uh, say right. But there are rewards. There are rewards for your service to the saints. There are rewards for your obedience to Christ. There are rewards for your faithfulness to the truth. The Bible does teach that. It's right here in 1 John, verse 8. You'll be fully rewarded. Paul writes to the Corinthians in chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the gospel, but he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Okay, I got grace. I got saved by grace. God gave me grace and made me an apostle, but it didn't have, it had an effect on my life. No, he goes, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. All the other apostles, Paul worked harder than all the other apostles. Now, he didn't earn anything. It was all by grace. But grace had an effect in his life where he worked, he served, he was a missionary. He did more than all the other apostles. But he told us earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15, he says, by the grace of God, by the grace God has given me, always, always attributes it to grace, always says it's grace, always says it's a favor that you didn't earn. God's always the one doing it by grace. By the grace of God, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. Each, but each one should be careful how he builds. No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. All right, Jesus is going to come back and judge. That's the day. And all your works that you do in his name, for his glory, all that stuff, 
it's going to be judged by how good it is, how long it lasts, the fruit that it is, and your motive that does it. If you have a good motive that does it for his glory, and it's good fruit, and it lasts a long time, that's gold, gold, silver, and precious stones. If it's bad motive, not long-lasting, not really good fruit, it ain't going to work. He says, it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss, and he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. This is what I think about Paul. Paul said, the grace of God was in me. I worked harder than all of them. I laid a foundation. I worked, I worked, I worked, I worked. But it was the grace of God with me. But I worked, and I believe Paul fully expects that he will receive a rich and full reward for his labor by grace. He says it in chapter 5, 2 Corinthians, verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what, what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And in John's context, that is, be faithful to the truth. Just hang on to the truth, believe the truth, and reject error. Do not be unfaithful to, to the truth. Do not uh, wave, wander off into false doctrine. Believe the true doctrine. Hang on to biblical true doctrine. Hang on to biblical true doctrine. Don't lose what you've accomplished. You'll be rewarded for hanging on to true doctrine. One more, Paul writes to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels. All right, look, that's a false teacher. Oh, well, you know, well, you know, I'm, it was God. Like the preacher that preached the best sermon you ever heard, and then he goes, well, it was God. And the, this, is, this is a true story. Preaching class, we had to preach in front of our peers, and the, pre the professor was there. And we had to make a sermon and preach for the class, and mine was horrible. But this one guy's, his was really good. He, and they, after he finished, everyone said, oh, wow, that was great. And he went, it was God. The professor said, well, it wasn't that good. <laughs> Seriously. False humility. Do not gloat over your false humility. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels, all kinds of things they make up that they say they saw, disqualify you for the prize. You get, you get, you get drawn in and as a great speaker, a great communicator, very dynamic, very appealing, good looking, it'll disqualify you. He'll disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, but his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. Watch out. Be on the lookout. Be careful of these deceivers. Don't fall for anything clever. Don't fall for anything fancy. Just stick to the same old doctrine. Stick to the same doctrine. That's what John's saying here. Many deceivers have gone into the world. They're deceivers and antichrist. Watch out. Don't lose what you worked hard for, what you've labored for. Be fully rewarded. Hang on to the truth. Let's pray. Father God, we are again grateful for your kindness that you have... Uh, given to us to let us have your word today. Lord, I pray that you spoke to all of us. I pray that you spoke grace to all of us. I pray that you spoke truth to all of us. I pray that the truth of your word has worked its way with power into our lives so that we will be diligent, careful, watchful, not to be drawn away by false teachers who mess up the doctrine of Christ, mess up the doctrine of everything. Keep us safe. Help us be, help us guard, help us watch. Do that for us so Jesus will be glorified in our lives. And uh, 
more than anything. I ask it in his name. Amen.